Uh, hello, happy Thursday. Um, I want to start this video off by addressing a complaint I received. Um, I received an email from one of you uh, saying, and I will read this, I will not reveal the identity of the person who sent this email, okay, but I read, quote, Yo dog, are those dumbbells instead of bookends? Also, you're inside. What's the point of the beanie? Keep it tight. Okay. So when I read this email, first of all, yes, dumbbells. This is a homemade bookshelf. I actually built it uh, out of scrap wood I found in my garage when I bought this house. Uh, so yeah, I'm not a bookend kind of guy. They're a little snobby for my taste, if i got to be honest. So yep, dumbbells are there. Um, but really what, what made me sad in this email was it became very obvious to me this person didn't understand what an accessory was. Okay. So what I've done is I've decided to show some tasteful examples of what's called accessorizing, okay? It's just kind of livening up an outfit with things that are not strictly necessary, okay? So you can see, beginning with this belt, okay? It's a very snazzy belt. My waist isn't even up there, right? It's not holding anything up because my shirt doesn't need to be held up, all right? But it's there. Looks nice. Uh, double watch, okay? Boom one facing each direction, so I can be sly if I need to, or I can send a message if I need to, right? Like, hey, this meeting is going a little bit long. Um, various colors of necklaces, very important, okay? You can't have enough bling there. And then a headband, okay? This is actually my wife's headband, but um, it gets the point across, okay? So think about it, accessorizing. Okay, now that we're two minutes into the video, uh, I'd like to get to the substance. All right. This will be our last Snow Day video, presumably. Um, we just finished talking about Pope Leo XIII yesterday. Um, he was Pope through 1903. He died in 1903. Following Leo, you've got this, what's called the Pian Era. Okay, you've got three Pope Piuses plus a Benedict. Okay, but basically between 1903 and 1958. So we're going to zoom through the history there. It's 55 years of, uh, well, two world wars, the beginning of the Cold War, communist revolutions, all kinds of things happening in this time period. But we're going to zoom through it. Okay. So, immediately after Pope Leo XIII, we have, where is this? Yeah. Okay. Pope St. Pius X. Okay. There is a society named after uh, St. Pope Pius, Pope St. Pius X. It's called SSPX. They are officially a schismatic group right now. Uh, maybe I'll mention them when we get to Vatican II. They split off after Vatican II. Anyway, uh, St. Pius X was, was awesome. So um, he didn't do a whole lot on the social teaching side, okay? He was actually much more um, concerned with what's called modernism, okay? Modernism is kind of like secular humanism. It's this very broad term. Uh, but generally, modernism uh, involves sort of a liberal, relativistic, kind of anti-supernatural trend uh, within the church uh, with theologians and historians, okay? So some examples of modernist ideas include um, religion is nothing more than a matter of psychology, okay? It's psychological experience. It's purely human. There's no divine or supernatural basis for it. Um, all church doctrines and structures can evolve and change, okay? So there's no such thing. Uh, there is no such thing, excuse me, as truly unchanging dogma, for instance, okay? Um, scripture is not divinely inspired, okay? It's just a record of subjective human religious experiences. Um, so the, the idea of the historical Jesus would be included in this category, that the Jesus of history is not the Jesus we read about in the Gospels, that idea, um, or the at least the denial of the fact that he did the, the miracles that are recorded in the gospels those are all modernistic ideas okay so pious obviously is going to be concerned about these ideas uh they were spreading at that time within the church so what he does let me that um in 1907 he has the holy office uh, which would be sort of like the congregation of the doctrine of the faith now they issued uh, a document called Lamentabili, condemns about 65 modernist propositions, uh, including things like uh, the, the ideas that I just mentioned, okay? 
Um, including, so the last one there is present day Catholicism cannot be reconciled with true science unless it be transformed into a kind of non dogmatic Christianity, that is, into a broad and liberal Protestantism. Okay, so lamentably condemned propositions like that. Uh, in 1910, um, Pius then issues uh, a mandate. He requires all priests to take what is known as the oath against modernism. Okay, so he required all priests to take an oath saying, I'm not going to teach these ideas, I'm not going to hold them, and I'm not going to spread them. Um, university, Catholic university and seminary professors were also typically required to take that oath. Some people still have to take that oath depending on where you're teaching. All right. All right, so modernism and the oath against modernism. Pius did a lot more than that, but we don't really have time to get into it. All right, so after uh, St. Pius X, you get Pope Benedict the Fifteenth. Okay, there we go. Zoom in there. Okay, obviously the last Pope Benedict before Benedict the Sixteenth. Um, Benedict the Fifteenth is Pope from 1914 through 1922. Uh, which means, of course, he's pope during World War I and its aftermath. Uh, during World War I, he made sure that the Vatican maintained diplomatic neutrality. Okay, didn't take a side either way. Some people criticized him for that. Uh, some people still are critical of him. Uh, but he did advance, he offered a seven-point peace plan, um, and he advocated for peace, obviously, throughout the whole thing, but the warring nations just ignored him. Um, he did carry out pretty large-scale charitable programs to take care of prisoners of war and those who were displaced by the war and so on. So he did some good things there. Um, but notably, once the war was over, Benedict wanted to participate in the negotiations at uh, the Treaty of Versailles when that was uh, being negotiated. Uh, but the Italian government said, no, we don't want you at the uh, peace talks. All right. So what's important about Benedict for our purposes here is we see in his pontificate, especially getting shut down by um, uh, the Italian government there, is that the Pope is, is transitioning from being a political ruler who's involved in uh, international political affairs, looking to protect the papal states, um, as well as looking out for the church, transitioning from that into kind of being a man without a country, um, and turning into more of a world teacher, okay? So more of a, a, a spiritual figure than a political figure, which is actually a good thing. All right, so after Benedict XV, move on to Pope Pius XI. Pius XI had a lot more going on in terms of social teaching. All right, so I'll hold this up here briefly. And there you go. Okay, so Pius XI, 1922 through 1939, uh, succeeds Benedict. Um, he is watching the Soviet Union uh, expand as a communist power. Uh, he sees the rise of fascism and Nazism, fascism in Germany and in Italy, Nazism obviously in Germany. Uh, he sees, he gets through the Great Depression, okay, and as the world progresses, almost to the brink of World War II by the time he dies. So the world's in rough shape uh, for pretty much his entire pontificate. Um, first thing that's notable here, um, when Mussolini came to power in Italy, uh, Italian strongman, he, uh, he and Pius negotiated what's known as the Lateran Treaty in 1929. Okay, This settled what was called the Roman question, which was the question of what do we do with the Vatican? Uh, because Italy had unified at this point, you've got unified Italy, um, now, with this little Vatican in the middle of Rome, what do we do with this? Um, so the Lateran Treaty uh, is based on an agreement in which Italy, as a state, agrees to recognize Vatican City as an independent sovereign state. Right. So this is where Vatican City comes from. Um, and it, it paid the Vatican back for some of the territory it lost. It made Catholicism the official religion of Italy. It allowed for religious instruction in Italian schools, okay, things like that. And then for its part, the Vatican formally recognized Italy's uh, sovereignty with Rome as its capital. That hadn't happened yet. So finally, we get this uh, permanent agreement. Up to that time, the Pope's official status had been that of a prisoner. Okay, Going all the way back to Pius IX, he had pronounced himself as a prisoner of the Vatican uh, when the Italian revolutionaries took the city. Okay. All right, a few years later... Um, 
Pius XI signed a concordat with Hitler in Germany. Uh, this is an agreement in which Pius hoped to preserve re the religious freedom of German Catholics and continue to protect clergy under uh, the rule of canon law. Um, he had no expectation that Hitler was going to honor the agreement, nor did Hitler actually honor the agreement, really, ever. Um, but it gave them something concrete that they could say, look, Hitler's violating this concordat, okay? Uh, so it was a pretty smart move in that sense. Um, the Nazis suppressed the church anyway, uh, and then 1937, this is maybe my favorite Pius XI moment, he writes an encyclical called Mit Brennender Sorg, okay, with burning something, okay, it's, it's bad. Anyway, it's the first and only papal encyclical ever to be published in a language other than Latin. The whole thing's written in German. And he knew the Nazis wouldn't let it into the country if they knew it was coming. So what he did was he had an army of people on motorcycles sneak this encyclical into Germany and deliver it to parishes via motorcycle. And then it was read from the pulpit of every Catholic church in Germany. And in that, Pius calls out the Nazis for violating the terms of the Concordat and uh, denounces their racist ideology and urges Catholics to resist the Nazi party. All right. That's a pretty cool move, I think. Hi, June. How you doing? Good. Um, but the cookies are not ready. The cookies are not ready? Well, you better be patient then, huh? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm making a video, so can you uh, stay quiet for a little while, too? Why? Because I don't want you to interrupt too much of the video. It's for my students. Okay? It's a, it's a long story, honey. But just try to be quiet, please, okay? I don't want to. Honey, please be quiet. Okay, why are you doing it that time? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to keep going. All right, uh, then the most relevant thing that Pius XI did in terms of social teaching was Quadragesimo Anno. Okay, this is another encyclical. This one's written in 1931, so some years before the Concordat with Germany. Um, but he publishes this on the 40th, for the 40th anniversary of Rerum Novarum. Okay, so in Quadragesimo Anno, Pius begins by uh, recounting and reaffirming the teaching of Leo XIII in Rerum Novarum. He highlights the impact that Rerum Novarum had in all kinds of fields, law, government, labor, social sciences. All right, then he addresses more specific issues. So when Leo wrote and condemned communism and socialism, these were basically abstract ideas, right? Um, by the time Pius XI is writing, 40 years later, uh, those things have become realities, okay? You've got communist uh, Russia at this point, all right? So the communist revolution took place there uh, during and after World War I, okay? So you've got a communist Russia that's been communist for over a decade. Socialism, those kinds of ideas have been spreading. Uh, so, Pius uh, repeats and amplifies Leo's critique of communism, especially the idea of class warfare. Uh, by then, the revolution had killed millions, literally millions of people in Russia, so he had all the more examples to draw on here. Um, the church was among those heavily persecuted there. Uh, he also addresses socialism. Okay, socialism was a little less extreme than communism, uh, but he criticizes socialism for reducing uh, the meaning of life to material advantage alone. Okay, in other words, taking these transcendental values uh, and dignity of the human person out of the picture. He uh, again advocates private ownership, especially of the means of production, and he encourages encourages peaceful dialogue and cooperation within industries and professions. Again, reiterating the, reiterating that idea of fraternal love or solidarity that Leo had laid out. Pius repeats the criticism of laissez-faire capitalism, um, again calling attention to the abuses and exploitation which came out of that. Um, Pius then criticizes statist solutions to, um, to these problems. Okay, so you've got laissez-faire capitalism, which is complete absence of regulation from the government. Then you've got statist solutions, which are way too much government intervention. Okay, uh, hence statist. All right, see the connection there. Um, so he criticized these interventions, which 
involve too much regulation and government intervention in trade, investing, and labor. All right. So he actually adds moral criteria on the state's intervention in society. Uh, what he proposes here is what's going to become a core principle of Catholic social teaching, which is subsidiarity. Okay. Subsidiarity states, the way he defines it, uh, it states that a community of a higher order should not interfere in the internal life of a community of a lower order, depriving the latter, the lower order community, of its functions, but rather should support it in case of need and help to coordinate its activity with the activities of the rest of society, always with a view to the common good. So it's technical, but here's an example. Okay, what he's saying in, in the case of the family, let's say, is that the government which is a society of a higher order, should not interfere with the internal life of the family, which is a society of a lower order, uh, depriving the family of its proper functions, such as, for example, making decisions regarding how to educate children. Uh, doing so, the, the state intervening in the family there would violate the rightful autonomy or independence of the family. It would be an issue of justice, okay, uh, based on the dignity of the human person. So we'll talk much more about subsidiarity, but uh, at this time, 1931, right, you've got fascism on the rise, you've got totalitarian regimes taking over in certain places. Subsidiarity is a crucial principle that is meant to limit the power of totalitarian governments. In other words, well, it's really meant to prevent them from being totalitarian. Okay. All right, so quadragesimo anno and subsidiarity, these are big things with Pius XI. Pope Pius XII, all right, he's the last Pope we're going to talk about today, all right, last of the Pian era. All right, so Pius XII uh, was Pope from 1939 through 1958, so a lot going on here too. Uh, he comes to the papal throne as World War II is about to break out. Um, he, like Benedict XV during World War I, he maintains official diplomatic neutrality uh, for the church. And by doing so, he's actually able to obtain for the city of Rome what's called an open status, uh, meaning that the city of Rome is exempt from military attacks. So it's like a safe zone. Uh, that allowed the Vatican then to shelter literally thousands of Jewish and non-Jewish um, refugees. Okay. Uh, some Jewish refugees even lived at the papal summer residence at Castel Gandolfo. All right. um, so through Pius's efforts, which were mostly underground, uh, done in secret, um, hundreds of thousands of Jewish lives were saved during World War II. Um, the full effects of this are still being uh, discovered right now, because a lot of it was done in secret. And people criticize Pius for not doing more for a long time. Now they've opened up the Vatican archives and they're saying, wow, he actually did quite a bit. Uh, the chief rabbi of Rome after the war, uh, Israel Zoli, he actually converted to Catholicism after the war. And for his baptismal name, he took the name Eugene, which he took because Pius XII's first name was Eugenio. Okay, So a huge tribute to Pius XII there. All right. Uh, like Benedict the Fifteenth during WW1, Pius XII laid out his own five-point peace plan during World War II. Uh, he did not issue any social encyclicals uh, expanding the church's social teaching, but he did deliver annual Christmas messages between 1939 and 1942, uh, each of which involved some social issues. Uh, he's urging peace and addressing some social issues. Nothing groundbreaking there, but it's uh, it was solid stuff. Um, after the war, then, Eastern Europe, of course, belongs to communist Daddy, Russia. Stuff that's broken with this tape. Okay, that's fair. That's a good idea. But can you please take this part off? What do you need? There. Oh, I can't reach it. There we go. Oh, the part that's folded? Yeah. Okay. Oh, dude, this is actually a roll of tape. Here, how about I tear some off for you, okay? Okay. Boom. And then I'll keep the rest of this up here. I'll take this part off. There. There you go. Please. Go fix some broken stuff, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to fix my secret. Sounds good. All right. So, um, 
after the war, Eastern Europe belongs to communist Russia. And um, then in 1949, you get the communist revolution in China. Okay. So you get Mao Zedong taking over there. Um, China then bans foreign missionaries, kick them out. Uh, we've seen this before, by the way. Uh, thousands of priests, religious, lay people, they are imprisoned and were forced into slave labor. Um, religious schools, institutions are closed. Again, communism is inherently and explicitly atheistic. Okay, so we don't want any religion there. All right. Um, Interestingly, in China, they create a state-run church, okay? All right, so this is called the Chinese Catholic Patriotic Association. It's, it's supposed to be uh, the official Catholic church in China. The state picks the bishops and the clergy, all right? They're basically Communist Party uh, uh, puppets, all right? But that's the official Catholic Church in China. Um, for a while, for decades, there was an underground church that was in communion with Rome that had real bishops. Recent, okay. So um, communism spreading throughout the world during uh, the post-war period under Pius XII's pontificate. In response to this, Pius again warns very strongly against the potential spread of communism to the West. And he declares that any Catholic who joins the Communist Party will be excommunicated. Okay. You can't be Catholic and Communist. It's, it's a contradiction. Okay. All right, takeaways. I know, you're like, when is this going to be over? Okay. Going to have to edit this video down. All right. Okay, so... Uh, the period from Pius X through Pius XII, 1903 to 1958, is one of world war and revolution, Okay, uh, especially involving the establishment of powerful communist regimes throughout the world. Um, all right, and so many of the things Leo XIII warned against, in theory, come to be a reality during this period. Okay, with the permanent loss of the Papal States, the Pope continues to transition from being a political leader with a vested interest in international politics uh, to that of an influential world teacher concerned primarily with the spiritual welfare of the human race. All right, so the encyclical, which is an apostolic letter addressed to the worldwide church, becomes even more and more important during this period. Uh, and, and that, of course, ends up contributing greatly to the development of Catholic social teaching. Okay. Uh, the Church also takes strong measures to repeat Leo's condemnations of communism and socialism, takes a stand against Nazism in Germany, um, and it continues to promote the rights of individuals to own property, the responsibility of the government to limit the abuse and exploitation of workers, and so on, Okay, continuing this post-industrial revolution stuff. Um, and it also develops the principle of subsidiarity as a safeguard against excessive government regulation and interference in the economics and social spheres. Okay. Uh, the most important document in the church's social teaching from this era is Pius XI's Quadragesimo Anno. All right. Uh, finally, through both world wars, the Vatican puts the church's social teaching into action, right? Uh, creating programs that saved hundreds of thousands of lives during the wars. Um, the extent of these efforts, like I mentioned, they're being uh, fully appreciated for the first time now as the archives have been opened up because uh, they're largely kept secret during the war. Okay, I'm going to cut this down a little bit so there will be some glitches in the video, but um, I think that's it. So I will see you tomorrow. All right, bye.